everyone. Um, oh, yeah, you have pressed record, Linda, just to confirm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good morning, everyone. Um, I'm George, um, and it's wonderful to give you this talk today on what should have been a talk solely devoted to the entire invertebrates. But unfortunately, due to the time constraints of having to fit this all into an hour, um, we're only going to talk about insects for the most part. We will touch upon um, other invertebrate orders and groups as well, but we, we might um, skim through those quite quickly. Um, if we had maybe more than an hour, we could get through them all, but seeing as there are so many different classifications and orders, there's um, quite a lot of material, so let's crack on. So I'm not gonna to spend too long on this. This is just a very little bit about um, who's gonna be speaking to you for the next hour. Um, so I'm an entomologist in, in West Wales, based in Aberystwyth, and uh, I've been practicing entomology for the past uh, six, seven years. And that I just love going out in the field with my net, that's in the top uh, left picture there, and my very much, much more recently, my new suction sampler. <laughs> And uh, so I've been doing this for a few years, just going out to various places, surveying, seeing what invertebrates are there, coming home and identifying them. And that's really how I've got into entomology. And I've sort of developed that into studying a master's at uh, Harper Adams University. So little free advertisement for them there. And also I've been doing um, current work at Denmark Farm um, this year as well, surveying the invertebrates in the different compartments. Um, that are there and seeing if Denmark Farm's management plans are, are being and management of the, of the area is being most beneficial to invertebrates. And I do do other sorts of uh, invertebrate contracts as well, such as delivering talks. <laughs> and if you wish to send me an email, I'm always happy to um, take questions or, on identifications or anything um, invertebrate related. And my email address is at the bottom there and it will be repeated at the end. So let's get started then. So uh, if you forgive me if I talk a bit quick, um, trying to fit this all into an hour is going to be tough going. So um, please bear with me on that. Um, so the world of terrestrial invertebrates then. Um, the two main things to take home from this slide is just how diverse they are. I mean, they've come in all sorts of different forms. We have some like the arachnids with eight legs. We have some like the insects with six legs. We have the millipedes and the centipedes with me very many legs. And we have other things like the slugs and snails and the worms with no legs at all. Though of course that morphology is much bigger than just legs, but that highlights the point. And there is also um, great diversity within groups as well. And so we have two insects here, if you can see my mouse moving. So we have a sawfly at the top, which is very different to the red and black frog hopper um, type of spittle bug underneath. And we're not going to spend too much on um, sort of the taxonomical uh, fundamentals. So I'm uh, just going to talk briefly about this. When I say an order, like an invertebrate order, it's just a level of classification and a level of grouping um, species which have similar features together and excludes those species which do not have those features. And that's the fundamental principle that's applied throughout all the different levels of um, classification. So an order, an insect or invertebrate order, is going to be a group of invertebrate or insect families that have similar features um, and excludes those species and groups which do not have those features. So um, this is a diagram that just highlights um, how diverse and uh, amazingly huge the invertebrate community is. So it's not an entire tree of life, but it's got the kingdom animalia, so all of the animals that covers a lot of the a lot of the higher life forms. Um, but as you can see through chordata here, these are the vertebrates. Um, they only make up really a small part of the animal world and a huge amount of it is made up by things like the arthropods and the worms, the mollusks, as well as all the other more obscure ones like the rotiferous nematodes and so tardigrades. So the, we are living very much in an invertebrate dominated world. And uh, we are going to talk a little bit about um, the mollusca, slugs and snails, uh, annelids, which is the worms. And, uh, but mostly we're gonna be talking about the subphylum here, hexapoda, as this contains the insects and their sister 
taxa. Okay then, so the major terrestrial invertebrate phyla then, just a little bit of a whirlwind. Uh, the mollusca, this contains the slugs and snails. Um, it also has marine representatives as well, but they contain the only sort of truly terrestrial representatives of that group. And they are the second largest invertebrate phylum as a whole, which is you know, not bad going considering sort of how big arthropoda is and um, how diverse a lot of these invertebrate groups are. And so their unique um, characters include the presence of the radula, which is um, their, um, their rasping tongue that they can use to um, cleave uh, material off of hard surfaces. Um, they also have a mantle, which is a type of muscle, um, very helpful for snails in coiling themselves into their shells. Also helpful for um, slugs as protection for um, their internal organs. And they also have a unique um, nervous system structure, which we will say for another time. Okay, the arthropods, and this contains the insects, um, are also the arachnids, the wood lice, the millipedes, and the centipedes, so incredibly diverse, and many of the groups that we are familiar with. Um, they are the largest invert phylum, and uh, they, are sh they share the characters of having a hardened exoskeleton, um, an ability to molt that exoskeleton, um, open circulatory systems, which basically means that their blood or hemolymph is not confined to blood vessels for the entire time of circulation. And they also have internal segmentation, which is different to the annelids to, on the right. Uh, these contain the earthworms and leeches, and uh, they're a small, or, a small phylum compared to the others. Um, but uh, of course, they have that uh, very characteristic external segmentation and the soft bodied um, they do not molt, but they do have a closed circulatory system. So focusing on the subphylum hexapoda then. So basically they, they are, un this is a grouping um, that contains just the insects and what is called the sister class Entognatha. We will come to that shortly. Um, but they are united with the arachnids, centipedes, millipedes, and crustacea in the phylum arthropoda, covered that. Um, so they all have, um, the, in the hexapoda, they all have six legs, and that's what hexapoda means, essentially six legs. Um, and they are uniting all the ones that, with six legs that molt. Um, they also have an easily discernible body plan of head, thorax, and abdomen, and the heads um, of the members usually have six fused segments. Um, seeing as they are fused, it's kind of hard to see, but they are there. Um, they contain two classes as covered, the Entognatha and Insecta. So let's start with the Entognatha. Um, these are closely related to the insects, but not closely related enough to be part of them. So they are sort of very, very, very primitive. Um, unfortunately, uh, you're probably seeing this. Can I move this? Oh, I can. That's good. Um, so unlike insects, their mouth parts are retracted inside their head. So if you look at an insect, you'll see very obvious mouth parts on the outside. This is not the case with this group. And this is, con this is what's considered to be a primitive feature. Um, all members of this group are wingless, so they don't have wings. Again, very, very primitive. And uh, they are, have what's called a metabolist development. So it's a set that's essentially, in its most basic definition, they look like adults and have all adult features or most adult features when they, when they hatch out of the egg and they simply just grow larger. And there are three main orders. There are the dipleurans, there are the proturans, and they are and the cutest of all, I think, the columbulans. And because <laughs> they are so dopey and dumpy little things. Um, I, and I think they're very sort of underestimated on their cuteness. Um, but all three are very morphologically different um, and they may not be that closely related. So there is some sort of um, dispute in the invertebrate world as to where they should be in relation to the insect. So then the many ways of grouping insect orders and the best, there are, the best way to do this is to look at the wings and how they develop. So we have three main ones here. There are other, other words um, that can be assigned to these, but we're gonna go with these. The first one is at pterygota. And what this essentially means is that they've got no wings. And so they have a very primitive body plan and growth. Um, so they have also have a metabolist development um, like the antagonathans. And 
that uh, it contains some familiar groups like the silverfish and jumping bristletails. The exopterygota, on the other hand, um, they have wings, so they're part of the of a group called the pterygota, which just means winged insect. And the wings and adult features grow gradually through nymphal stages in molts. So they are described as what's called um, hemimetabolists. And this includes very familiar groups like the grasshoppers and the true bugs, so things like shield bugs, um, earwigs, cockroaches and termites and so on and so forth. And then finally, we have the endopterygota, which are the winged insects, um, where the adult features grow through metamorphosis. So this includes things like the butterflies, moths, bees, wasps, ants, flies, so on and so forth, all groups that we are very, very familiar with. And this is considered to be sort of the most advanced state, evolutionary speaking. But let's dive into some of these orders then. So we have the Archaeognatha and the silverfish. So let's talk about the Archaeognatha or jumping bristletails. They are characterized by narrow and elongated bodies and one of the best features of them is that their thorax is notably large. Um, they also have um, three what are essentially tails at the end and separating these from silverfish is quite nice because the two um, tails on the side are much shorter than the one in the middle. Um, they're not a huge species order, and there are only 300 to 500 species worldwide. Um, most of them are what's known, what's called phytophagous, which just literally means that they eat plant material, and there are others that are detritivores. And there are only around seven UK species in one family, the Machaidae, um, and they are very, very generally tricky <laughs> to identify. Um, the ones pictured are of the genus Petrobius, and you can't see the features, unfortunately, but they, the genus is indicated by pink ocelli. Um, now, ocelli are just three primitive eyes, usually located on the top of the head, and they are different to the main eyes that you see on the sides of the insect. Um, and these ocelli are also bow-shaped. And um, the species pictured, apparently, is um, Petrobius maritimus. And if you see a, um, sort of a jumping bristletail on a coastal area, either on the beach or on the coastal cliff, it's very likely to be this one. And then moving to something we should all be very familiar with is the silverfish. And they are very similar to the um, jumping bristletails, but their two sort of tail-like appendages um, are, are um, much longer and well, much longer compared to the central one. So there is only a small difference between them. And um, most species also tend to lack rosselli and they also have small eyes. And there are up to 600 species of these globally. So again, not very, very specious. Um, and they tend to enjoy carbohydrate rich foodstuffs, which, what, which is what gives um, the most common one here in the UK, its Latin name, Lepisma saccharina with saccharina, of course, being a common carbohydrate. And uh, there are now three UK species, which adds a bit of complexity, but um, Lepisma is usually identified by its silvery scales and its movement, which is believed to be very sort of fish-like. Um, they are, I've included the map of their, of their records here in the, in the bottom right picture, because I think they are shockingly under-recorded so if there are any invertebrate recorders that are listening here, please do submit your silverfish records because we totally don't have an accurate picture of them at the moment. I mean, I think almost every household has had a silverfish in it at some point. So um, yeah, please do submit a record of them when you do see them. Okay, moving on to the mayflies. So these are an advancement on the jumping bristletails and the silverfish in that they actually have wings. And, <laughs> um, but they are considered primitive in a number of respects. Um, so they are narrow bodied, that's not necessarily primitive. Um, and they usually have two wings and they tend to miss the, um, the hind wings and they tend to be, these tend to be either small or absent. Um, the wings they do have are triangular and they are held vertically above the abdomen. And the key thing here is that they cannot be held flat that is considered to be quite primitive. If an insect can't fold its wings over its back, then it's um, considered to be primitive. 
Um, it also has two caudal appendages. These are basically tail-like structures. And again, these are generally considered to be quite a primitive feature. They also have um, relatively um, short antennae compared to other orders. And um, their mouth parts are also non-functional. And this is generally linked to their um, primitively short adult life cycle. So they don't really need to have um, mouth parts that are functional if they're not going to be eating. Um, they also have aquatic larvae with which sport abdominal gills, and they are indicators of good water quality. Um, but uh, the presence of aquatic larvae in an order is also considered to be primitive. Usually, if you're an advanced insect order, you have terrestrial larvae, but there are differences and, uh, in that, and we will come to some of those later. And uh, of course, they can characteristically emerge as adults in very massive numbers for some species. And the example we have here is the green drake mayfly, Ephemera danica. It's a very, very large species um, for UK standards. And uh, it can be quite common around fast moving streams and unpolluted lakes. Um, its abdomen is quite characteristically pale. It has very pale stripes on it, but it also has a pale grain sheen between those. And um, it'll, its caudal appendages or tails are also quite dark. Um, but its wing blotches, which are these sort of dark areas here, they're also um, distinctive in their pattern and location on the wings. So if you see a uh, mayfly with these features, it's very likely to be a green drake mayfly. Moving on to the Odonata then, they are often grouped with the mayflies for similarly primitive features. Um, so they are defined by being narrow, narrow bodied and uh, narrow in terms of having narrow wings, um, but being relatively large as at the same time. <laughs> Um, so they and uh, they have with their wings, they are equally sized as well. So usually in more advanced orders, um, the, the, there's usually a difference in character between the two sets of wings. And their larvae are aquatic. And uh, they're also reminiscent of the Megan Isoptera. And these are the um, huge, huge, huge dragonfly-like species that were once roaming the earth in the Carboniferous times, but um, they're not actually of the same order. Um, but I believe they are um, grouped together in a higher classification. And there are 5,600 recorded species globally, and there are 49 in the UK and nine families. So if you're first starting out on insect recording, they're a good one to start with as they're not massive, massive. So what are the differences between sort of dragonflies and damselflies then? Well, dragonflies tend to be much broader and longer than damsels. So they are, you know, they're essentially bigger and they hold their wings at 90 degrees when at rest. That's a key feature in telling the difference between them and adults. Um, so the larvae breathe through what's called an anal tube. And so it allows them to breathe air. And the species we have pictured is the golden ringed dragonfly. And it's one of our unmistakably large species at up to 84 millimeters long. Um, and it has a black body with um, yellow markings which break up that black. So you, if you see one like that, you can't really go wrong. Um, we also have the damselflies now, and they're narrower and shorter in dimension, generally speaking and they hold their wings above their abdomen, so they don't hold them at 90 degrees. And they, the larvae also breathe via gills rather than an anal tube. And the species we have pictured is the large red damselfly. Um, it's got, its red markings are unmistakable, um, but um, the females generally do feature more black, so we have a male pictured here. Um, the black legs, and the pterostigma, but the pterostigma being a wing cell that's just colored. So it's an area of the wing that's just got a bit of pigment um, in. Um, this, um, this is important because it, it, there is also the small red damselfly, but this has red legs and the red pterostigma. Okay, then moving on to the plecoptera. Now, this is the first of a few orders that we will talk about, which are um, considered to be more closely related to the grasshoppers and bush crickets than to any other insect order as a whole. Um, so they're an advancement on mayflies and odonata in that their wings can be folded flat over their abdomens. 
And, uh, but they do still possess quite a few primitive characteristics. As you can see in the picture there, um, they tend to sport um, tail-like appendages or circe that's possessed by both the adults and the larvae. Um, most adults do not feed uh, due to a short-term adult life. Um, but they do sport simple chewing mouth parts, which um, can be functional. Um, so, so generally, they have a simple body plan with a lack of specialization. And the, the word specialization is important because if you've, if you've um, got a feature that's changed on something that ancient insects used to have, um, then that's considered to be a more advanced stage. Um, there are, the aquatic nymphs um, inhabit oxygen-rich streams and lakes, and they can be a strong indicator of, of pollution or lack thereof uh, in water bodies. And um, they're quite weak and erratic flyers, so not the most strong as compared to some other orders. Um, but they are globally distributed with um, at least 3,500 species. So it's a bit of an improvement on some of the other numbers that we've had. Um, and there are 34 in the UK in seven families. And the species we have pictured is the predatory stonefly. It's predominantly dark, but um, the orange markings behind the head and just above the wings are distinctive. The tails are also, or caudal appendages are also comparatively short compared to other species. And the males, as in, as in the one pictured, are brachypterous. Uh, brachypterous just essentially means that the wings do not stretch all the way down to the tip of the abdomen. So the females are described as being macropterous here and conversely that's when the wings do stretch to at least the end of the abdomen or beyond. So moving on to the orthoptera then, the grasshoppers, bush crickets and allies themselves, um, they, as I said, they defined a whole group of different insect orders. Um, they are broadly cylindrically body shaped um, with either short or long antennae and wings. We will get to that shortly. And they also have long hind legs designed for jumping with various special adaptations for that. Um, they have heavy metabolist nymphs. Um, so they grow gradually through um, various nymphal stages to acquire their adult um, wings and characteristics. And so I'm sure you've all heard the grasshoppers um, during the day or the crickets and bush crickets in the evening and night. Um, that sound you're hearing is a, is a result of what's called stridulation. And it's basically the rubbing of structures on their legs to their wings. And this produces the sound that you're hearing. So if you do manage to see one making a sound, do take a close look at them and you should be able to see them rubbing that leg to that wing. Um, there are more than 20,000 species globally, um, and there are at least 30 in Britain. So the Ensipera then, this contains the crickets, the bush crickets, the katydids and wheaters. We do not have katydids or wheaters uh, in this country, unfortunately. They tend to be a more tropical and uh, southern hemisphere um, specialty. Um, they are weaker jumpers um, compared to the grasshopper relatives, um, and they tend to have narrower hind legs um, to represent that. So if you just compare the leg size between the, the spotted bush cricket up here and the grasshopper down here, you can see that their legs are noticeably narrower. And the females also tend to sport a blade-like ovipositor. So if, if there is an individual you come across with a long sort of long appendage on the end, it's generally going to be a female. Um, the species pictured is a speckled bush cricket. And if you can't see it too well in the picture, unfortunately, but if you look closely at one, um, then you should see it's absolutely plastered in these tiny little sort of dark reddish dots. And so that's very distinctive for the species. And um, they're also relatively large and brachypterous. So moving on to the sea lifter then, the grasshoppers, groundhoppers, uh, pygmy mole crickets and locusts amongst others. Um, they are stronger jumpers with stockier hind legs. And the key thing here is that their antennae are much shorter. So if you're ever wondering uh, if you're looking at a cricket or a grasshopper, usually just look at the antennae and they'll tell you. Um, the species we have pictured is the meadow grasshopper. 
So it's a very nice distinctive species with its sort of bright green coloration and sort of mottled um, abdomen. And it's also got this lovely, lovely sort of hay colored stripe along the top. Um, it's all, uh, at the top of the animal as well, between the head and the abdomen is what's called the thorax. Um, but it's also in grasshoppers called the saddle. And um, this contains a few shallowly curved heels, um, basically referring to these um, pale lines and these dark lines here. And um, in other species, they tend to be more strongly curved. And also in this species, the female is distinctly precipitous, and this is not always the case in other species. Moving on to the earwigs then. Uh, okay, so these are another sort of relative of Orthoptera. They are characteristically flattened and give a very broad appearance as a whole. Um, the antennae tend to be just sort of simple filamentous forms and uh, their mouth parts are chewing, um, which um, sort of helps with their um, mainly phytophagous diet. And the key thing with earwigs is what a lot of people call their pincers or circe. And the shape and coloration and characteristics of this is useful in species identification. Um, their wings, their forewings are also very short and um, very leather-like. And they sort of have a protective function of the more membranous hind wings underneath. So that's kind of a derived state. So that's a, a much more advanced state of affairs. Um, they seldom fly and um, are mainly nocturnal. They will only fly if they really have to. Um, and if you go out on a nice walk somewhere at night, either through dunes or woodland, then you'll probably see quite a few of these. Um, the females are also very famous for showing maternal care and actually only one of a few insect examples that do this. Um, so they ensure their eggs are warm, that they're clean, and they will dutifully and very dutifully protect them from predators. So even going um, for other invertebrates and insects that are much um, larger than themselves. And she will feed the nymphs um, regurgitated food as well when they hatch. And the species pictured is the common earwig. So we should hopefully all have plenty of these in our gardens. And uh, it's unmistakable from its size. So it's about 13 millimeters. And the coloration of various parts of it, including sort of the, the head, the abdomen, those four wings and the circe are also um, distinctive. Um, the, sh the shield shape of the four wings as well, that sort of broken shield with the line down the middle is also um, a nice um, feature, and as are the coloration of the Circe, uh, which can be large and curved in males, as in the bottom picture, or straighter in females. And if you can see the bottom picture here, this is just sort of the unfolded hind wing here. Okay, then moving on to the Socoptera or the bark flies. Um, these are one of a group of orders that are called hemipteroids, and this is just that they more closely related to the true bugs than they are to the orthoptera, so the grasshoppers and bush crickets. Um, they're also closely related to the biting and sucking lice um, known as the thyractra, um, but uh, we won't be covering um, those in depth unfortunately. Um, so they are characteristically small as an order. Most species um, contained are only a few millimeters long but a key distinguishing feature between them and the true bugs is that they have chewing mouth parts. And uh, this is useful for their diet of algae, lichens and fungi, um, which they often get off of the bark of trees, hence their name bark flies. Um, they hold their wings tent-like over their abdomen when at rest. And what's very notable in the order is that the markings on the wings um, and also an enlarged area of the face um, are very useful in, in their species identification. So there are 5,000 species worldwide, so not the, not the most diverse by any means, but um, not too bad. There are approximately 100 UK species in 19 families. And the species we have pictured is Rafoscus cruciatus. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a common name, but it's patternings on its wings, like as discussed, is very distinctive, particularly these sort of paler ones towards the end. So they're, 
their positioning and um, size is what makes it Prophoscus cruciatus. And uh, so they are found on a very wide variety of trees and shrubs, this species, and uh, this reflects their generalist diet. You do get some bark flies with a more specialized diet and they're much scarcer. And you're actually very likely to be near a Grafoscus, um, but uh, spotting one is a very hard challenge due to their very small size. Moving on to the true bugs themselves then. So the true bugs are composed of three very distinct suborders. Um, these are all united um, by the presence of a rostrum. So the rostrum is a very highly modified mouth part. So remember, we like the term modified because it means an advanced state. Um, so they don't have chewing mouth parts anymore. They have basically a straw. And uh, there's two tubes in that straw. And um, one allows, the, allows them to exude enzymes and spit, essentially, to um, digest. Their, their material um, that they want to consume extra orally. And then the other tube is for um, sucking up the products of that digestion. And there are approximately 100,000 species worldwide. So they are the most species rich hemimetabolous order. So they are the most, they are the, the order with them um, that has nymphs essentially um, with the most species in. So they're the most successful of that group. And there are 1,830 UK species in 63 families. So talking about the suborder Orchenaranca then, um, this includes the frog hoppers or spittle bugs the, and their relatives, the plant hoppers, leaf hoppers, cicadas. Um, so we should all be very familiar with the frog hoppers but given many of the species produce spittle. Um, their four wings um, can either be membranous or hardened. So this is a this is a key differentiation with the heptrophe, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, they are immensely strong jumpers. They are even more um, advanced on their jumping abilities than the grasshoppers and crickets. Um, they have various bits of machinery that enable them to do this, and that's we can have a whole session on that in itself. Um, but the species we have pictured is the red and black frog hopper. And it's distinctly large amongst our biggest in the UK. And its coloration is completely unmistakable. Um, so you, if you see one that's got that red and black um, coloration, you cannot go wrong with it. And uh, the nymphs produce spittle as do most frog hoppers bar one family. Moving on to the heteroptera then. Let's see if I can move that out of the way. This includes the shield bugs and their relatives, the plant bugs, squash bugs, ground bugs, and damsel bugs. And um, so um, many, many, many um, groups there that are very common in meadows and grasslands and whatnot. And um, they possess what's known as hemi elytra. So you probably heard the term elytra referred to beetles, coleoptera, um, which is their hardened wing case. And um, so the um, heteropterans have um, semi-hardened. So half of their forewing is hardened and then the remaining half is membranous. And this is quite nicely shown by this um, gorse shield bug here. And also differing to the um, frog hoppers and their relatives, and their, the heteropteran wings are held flat over their back when at rest. Okay then, so I've wanted to include a species example for most orders, um, and it's very tempting just to put the um, most common and easy to identify one down. So in this case, it would probably be like the green, common green shield bug, but I thought I'd put a different one, the gorse shield bug. Um, it's mainly found on gorse and broom, as are many species that are just unique to that family of plants. So do, um, do appreciate all the gorse and broom that's around and do have a good look at it when you next see some, because you may see a gorse shield bug. Um, the adults are very large and they have a yellow margin um, around, uh, around the margin of the whole body um, that uh, extends from the head all the way to the wingtip. And uh, they have their shoulders are smooth and rounded. Uh, so in shield bug identification, the shape of the shoulders and the dimension of the shoulders can be quite um, a distinctive feature. And in this species, they are very, very smooth and rounded. 
and they are predominantly green um, with varying degrees of red. So this individual is very, very red for um, a gold shield bug. Most gold shield bugs you'll see generally have the green coloration you see in the scutellum, which is this upside down triangle here. And um, they also have very, very coarse punctures. So if you hear um, an insect or invertebrate that's got punctures, it's referring to these sort of small dark indentations that are scattered over the body. And you can't really, really see it too clearly in the picture, but if you have a close up view of a, of a shield bug, next time you see one, you will see these sort of little pits and these are the punctures. And then finally then the Sternorinca, these are the aphids and their relatives, the scale insects. They have a simplified morphology, um, which um, is derived from their highly complex lifestyle. So um, they, um, they have very, diff very various different um, things um, that we talk about a lot in biology. And so one of these is parthenogenesis. Um, so um, they are able, basically females are able to reproduce without mating with a male as a form of cloning. And they also show different degrees of use sociality um, depending on the species, um, which are very similar to the social behavior of um, some uh, wasps and bees. And uh, they also have generations with roles. So they'll have the founding female who's winged. She will give birth to many, many generations of wingless females. Um, but when resources become dry or if a predator becomes close, um, she will start producing winged um, forms and these will go off and colonize um, other plants. And um, there, there are various um, variations of this. Um, they are a very important group as pests for us, of course, but also um, for many other insect orders which rely on them, such as the such as various ant species which farm them for their honeydew, or um, the ladybird larvae and um, lacewing larvae um, as their larval food. So these are some of the. Um, Exopterygoat insect orders that unfortunately we could not um, go through in a lot of detail today due to time. I noticed we're already 35 minutes in. Um, these include the frips, angel insects, vice, ice and rock crawlers, web spinners, cockroaches and termites, which are in a close relation to the praying mantises, but also the stick and leaf insects. So we will have to save these for another time. Um, these are all um, insect orders which um, have nymphal stages. And we're about to move on to those which pupate. And then, so starting off with the Hymenoptera then, they are a very large order with over 150,000 species worldwide. And there are 7,000 in the UK at least with um, 57 families. Um, all the members are united by the presence of Hamuli, and these are uh, hooked bristles on the hind wing and um, which lock together with the forewing. Um, and most members have small eyes with small facets. So a lot of people tend to confuse a fly with a hymenopteran. Uh, so basically a bee, wasp, ant, sawfly. Um, if the eyes are generally occupying a small area of the face and um, you can't really see the facets or, of those eyes all that clearly, um, then it's most likely to be a hymenopteran you're looking at. And um, there are two distinct suborders. So there's the symphata, known as the sawflies, and the apropriata, which is the bees, wasps, and ants. And I think I've accidentally cut off half of that sentence there. So um, starting on the sawflies then. So they're the most basal or primitive of the um, hymenoptera as a whole. Um, and they have a number of features which suggest this, and this includes the lack of a narrow waist. Um, the adults are also relatively short-lived, only up to 10 days. Their larvae are incredibly lepidopteran-like. So by lepidoptera, I'm of course talking about the um, butterflies and moths. So they're basically, their larvae are very caterpillar-like, and this is also reflected in their diet, which is mainly plant material, and, and it sometimes can be very hard to tell the difference. Um, they are universally solitary, um, so there's no, there's generally no um, complex um, sociality occurring in the group. Um, and the females also possess um, a saw-like ovipositor, so not a sting, 
um, they have a, a, a proper ovips or like ovipositor, and that's what gives them their name. Um, they do have some mimicry of wasps um, and aposomatism, so basically advertising to would be predators that um, they're distasteful and they're sort of um, hitching mm. on the looks of their relatives to achieve that. Um, the example we have here is the turnip sawfly. So I'm sure um, some of you, maybe all, would have come across a lot of um, mm. sort of orange and black sawflies before, a few small ones. Um, this is one of the ones that is quite easy to identify because it's got on its thorax um, two sort of sideways on triangles that I think looks quite like a TIE fighter um, uh, from Star Wars. So if it's got that appearance in black coloration, then it's quite likely to be the turnip sawfly. Otherwise, it's also got this hourglass shape or eight shape of um, orange coloration. And they are very common and regularly seen on umbellifers. So um, these include plants like hogweed. And they are superficially, um, superficially similar to the other orange and black ones as we've, as we've covered. So moving on to the bees, wasps and ants then. These on the other hand have very grub-like larvae. Um, so in complete contrast to um, the uh, sawflies. And these are either reared on pollen or um, other insects. Um, all members, um, have a thinned waist. Um, this is most obvious in the wasps and ants where many have what's known as a petiole, um, but it's also the case in bees as well, as you can just see in, in just about see perhaps in this picture of the female tawny mining bee. Um, bees are mainly phytophagous, um, so they consume pollen, plant pollen and um, nectar with uh, just a few um, variations. And um, wasps and ants, on the other hand, are, are either mainly omnivorous um, or parasitic. Um, there are differing degrees of sociality that occur. So there's a group called the solitary bees. Um, some argue whether they're strictly solitary because they will gather together in um, aggregations um, to, form their, to form nesting tunnels, but they will build their own tunnels and procure material for their own young. And then, of course, there is those that are more famous, like the bumblebees, the honeybees, and, and the wasps, which are very, very solitary with um, social, I should say, with um, caste systems. And if you wish to tune in to um, my talk I'm giving as well on the 17th of August, I'll be going into this in depth. So we will have a whole session dedicated to the Hymenoptera. Um, there are many parasitic groups, of course, as well. Um, some parasitize um, other invertebrates, um, others parasitize plants. Um, again, we will cover this. Um, species example we have is the um, tawny mining bee. And uh, the females are the most sort of bumblebee-like solitary bee that you'll probably come across. Um, she's um, st very stockily built like a small bumblebee. And uh, she's covered with fox red hair with the only exception being the sort of rich black hair of the head and the legs. Um, the males on the other hand are much slender move this out of the way. Um, but the most defining feature is his white moustache. So if you come across a small solitary bee with long antennae and it's got um, sort of a clump of white hair at the bottom of the face, it's likely to be a male tawny mining bee. And if you've got currants in your garden, do look out for them because the females um, do love to collect pollen from them. And uh, I have seen plenty of them on my current bushes this year. Okay, then moving on, oops, moving on to the beetles, the beetles and weevils in the Coleoptera. They are the largest insect order with approximately 400,000 species globally. And that's, that's very, very impressive. Um, but there is rivalry between Coleopterists, Dipterists, and Hymenopterists as to whose order is the biggest. I'm, I'm one of those sort of see it to believe it with the evidence. And seeing as there are more described species of Coleoptera, I'm of the personal opinion that the Coleoptera are the most species rich at the moment. Um, but so you never know when they describe more um, Hymenoptera and Diptera, perhaps they'll take over, you never know. But anyway, there's a huge diversity in morphology and ecology that reflects this species richness. 
but all of them are united by, um, they're completely sclerotized, um, basically fancy words for hardened four wings into elytra. And in the beetles, which do have wings, this protects the membranous ones underneath. Um, in the species which do um, not fly at all and do not even have hind wings, the elytra are just fused. Um, with the, in those that do have wings, the, the, the hind mm. wings are held flat over the back of the abdomen. And they contain many mimics, mostly of, of Hymenoptera, such as Repella maculata here. Um, it's from the family of uh, beetles called longhorns, um, named for their comparatively long antennae to other beetle groups. Um, they are distinctly large um, amongst the longhorns and they have um, a wasp mimicking coloration so it, it's not to be confused with another close relative called the wasp beetle, um, but it has a completely black um, abdomen with very narrow yellow bands. That, of course, these ones are quite broad and they are common along hedgerows and woody edges. And you will often find them actually just sitting on a bramble flower. So when the bramble flowers do come out, I think they're just the beginning to start. And do look out for them because they will just be there sitting in them. <laughs> and they will also do the same on embellifers. Odemera lurida, on the other hand, again, I wanted to give us a different example because I could have put Odemera nobilis, which is a very common swollen thigh beetle. This one is equally common, um, but it's uh, notably smaller than its swollen thigh relative. Um, at just five to eight millimeters, but it's also sort of predominantly dark gray green, not the bright fluorescent green of um, the swollen thigh. It also has normal sized um, hind legs in the male, um, not the really enlarged ones in the swollen thigh. Um, and they are often found with their elytra partially open, um, either in or on flowers. Moving on to the lace wings then and their relatives, just keeping a careful note of the time now, <laughs> might have to um, be a bit briefer. Um, so this contains the lace wings, the mantid flies, the antlions and their allies. And um, so there's a large diversity of morphology and ecology. Um, they are the least specialized of all the endopterygota, mostly because of their chewing mouth parts that's present in both the adults and the larvae. Um, the adults possess long and slender antennae, that's quite a key feature for the order, um, with both the fore and hind wings being large. Um, the wings are often netted and held tent like above and beside their abdomen. And uh, the sort of patterna patternings on those wings can be key um, to their identification in some species. Um, the larvae um, are famously voracious predators of other small insects, um, notably um, aphids. So they are gardeners and uh, farmers' friend um, as a natural biological pest control. And the adults also caught by, by vibrations, um, which they make and transmit through their feet on um, whatever sort of substrate they are on. And uh, there are approximately 6,000 species worldwide and 70 British species in six families. And the example we have here is the giant lacewing. And its base, its key character is its immense size. <laughs> if it's a very big lacewing you're looking at, it's quite likely to be this one, um, upwards of 25 millimeters. It's also got very dark spotting on its wings. And this spotting is um, quite distinctive because of the clear, um, against the clear background and the positioning of those dark spotches and blot spots and blotches. And the larvae are partially aquatic of this, for this species in particular, not generally for, other, for the order as a whole. Um, they hunt in wet moss and damp habitats and can be found near wooded streams. Just gonna talk a, um, quickly on the scorpion flies and snake flies. Um, I'm sure most of us would have come across a scorpion fly at some point, um, perhaps not so much a snake fly. Um, scorpion flies named for um, their very scorpion-like appearance, um, most notably in the um, genital capsule, um, as pictured here, which um, looks very much like a sting of a scorpion. Um, but they are often very brightly colored um, with wing, lots of wing venation and patterning, and they also possess a long beak. Um, some families um, are more closely related to the fleas, 
others to the true fly. So these aren't actually true flies, despite their name. Um, but so there is some dispute on where they should be placed compared to other insect orders. Um, but they're generally a small order with up to 600 species, and they're mostly scavengers of disease of deceased um, invertebrates and vertebrates, so they can be useful in, in uh, forensics. Um, there are four UK species, and you're most likely to come across the Panopidae. Um, this is uh, identified by their wing and abdominal patterning and coloration, so it's fairly distinctive. Um, the genital capsule can be key. Um, to species identification. And you generally need a male for this. As uh, an example, the male um, um, Panorpa communis um, has a caliper-shaped capsule. Snake flies, on the other hand, not very likely to come across one because the adults spend most of their time high up in the canopy um, where they are predatory, mostly predatory of other uh. invertebrates. Um, they are also what's described as relictual in their distribution because they are not found at all in the tropics. They are strictly temperate, um, but they were once more diverse in, and widely distributed in the past than they are today. Um, so there are only 225 known species in two families, so they're not very diverse at all. But, so we're lucky to have four here in the UK, um, uh, and they're generally very tricky to identify. And the head shape and the uh, distribution and characters of punctures, remembering punctures are those indentations that you get on the body of some invertebrates, um, they can be important. And the wing venation is also um, very helpful. So the species here, Phaeostigma notata, it has a lot of what's called small veins along the top of its wing. And the number of these, 12 to 15, that range can be helpful for that species identification. Um, they are called stake flies, by the way, um, for their elongated thorax or neck, um, which is mobile and can be moved um, in a snake-like fashion. So hence their name. Okay, then moving on to the caddis flies, um, the trichoptera, again, not true flies. Um, the adults are medium-sized um, uh, insects compared to other orders. Um, they're characteristically hairy on their bodies and wings, and we will come to this uh, a little bit more in the butterflies and the lepidoptera. Um, they have long and shred-like antennae, and their wings are held tent-like at rest again, similar to the lace wings. Um, their, their larvae are secondarily aquatic. So this means that they evolved from a common ancestor long ago um, that had terrestrial larvae. So this is in no way a, um, a primitive state. Um, it's a, a more derived state because it has evolved from those that were terrestrial. Um, but the larvae, of course, are famous architects with architects with the suborder oh or spiky palpia making silken nets and domes and the suborder integra palpia making cases and fixed retreats out of detritus and little stones and i believe there are some um uh, researchers or, or yeah. businesses that uh, make jewelry out of them um, they are the sister taxa to the lepidoptera and that's where we're going to talk about their hairs a little bit um and the the most and the most recent common ancestor um uh, of the trichopter likely had marine um, larvae. Um, so that's very, very interesting. Um, to, I find it very interesting to think um, of various um, insects that are actually marine because they're not common at all. So obviously it was a bit more common once upon a time. Um, but there are 14,500 species worldwide, 200 British and 19 families. And the example we have here is Mr. Sides azuria. They've got bluish black wings with the tip folded back and they have exceptionally long antennae. Unfortunately, in this overexposed picture of mine, <laughs> you can't really appreciate that, but they are twice the body length of the individual there. And the males have these very large and hairy maxillary palps. Um, and the black hair is important to note here. The black hairs are shiny and not matte meaning that it's Mr. Saides azuria and not Mr. Saides nigra. Very likely to see this um, along um, vegetation near um, wetlands and river flowing areas. Okay, then the Lepidoptera, just being very aware of the time now. Um, they're very large insect order, um, surprisingly large actually, 180,000 species worldwide. 
Um, there are some dubious differences between moths and butterflies. There is some sort of debate as to whether there is true differences or not. Um, the, some have suggested antennae shapes, um, some being more common in butterflies than in moths, but there is crossover, of course. And not every moth has what's known as a frenulum. So um, there is debate on that. But whatever the case, the major unifying characters is the evolution of wing and body scales. And these are just essentially shortened and flattened um, versions of the caddis fly hairs. So hence their relation. Um, they also possess a proboscis. Um, so this is rather similar to the rostrum of, uh, of a um, of a true bug, but it's just used for generally sucking. And um, it allows them to drink nectar um, whilst looking out for um, potential threats. So they don't actually have to bury their head in the flower and be caught unawares by a predator. Um, very famous for um, crypsis, so fancy word for camouflage. They would, some species like to blend into their environment. Um, and aposematism, so like many butterflies um, liking to look um, distasteful to their would-be predators. Um, they're hugely important for ecosystems because, of course, the caterpillars are important for various birds, also other parasitic um, invertebrates. And they're a classic example of hollow metabolism, basically meaning they pupate. And we have the ringlet here as an example, um, characterized by dark coloration, dark brown coloration with a number of eye spots, generally six um, when they are closed that are visible. Um, also usually eight <laughs> when the wings are open, but you can get some variations such as this one, which has, um, I believe seven. Okay there, and also a little moth example here is the current clear wing. It doesn't, unlike um, the, the rest of the order, and there are obviously other exceptions, um, the, the wings aren't always exceptionally large for the body size. Um, this is one of the examples in the clear wings. It's very fond of currants. So again, keep an eye on your currant bushes in your gardens if you do have them and they are a distinctive group. Um, talking about the diptera then, so these are the true flies. There are at least 150,000 described species and the huge diversity in morphology and ecology that comes with that includes many groups we are familiar with. So the crane flies, house flies, blow flies, so on and so forth. Um, they are all united by having only two wings, um, with their hind wings having evolved into something called halters. And the halters are now an important sensory organ in um, flight orientation. And they are also a fundamental order for contemporary in ecosystems because of the many that are detritivores, and also for forensics for the same reason. Um, so an example we have here is tipula luna. So crane flies are considered to be amongst the most primitive flies and um, characterized by the, a large size, long cylindrical bodies, as well as long and cylindrical uh, and deciduous <laughs> legs. And uh, by deciduous, I just mean that the legs uh, come off easy as an anti-predator defense. And Tipula luna, this picture actually taken from Denmark Farm recently, um, is easily identified by its predominantly gray coloration and uh, broken by stripes of brown on the thorax and the abdomen. It's also a nice red tip to the abdomen. And also can't mention flies without mentioning hoverflies. We have the pellucid fly here, very, very sort of distinctive species. Um, that mo hover most hoverflies are united by what's called a spurious wing vein. It's essentially a fake, not real um, wing vein. Uh, <laughs> and most species um, mimic other insect orders, um, mostly the Hymenoptera. Um, some are better at it than others. The pellucid fly is believed to be a wasp mimic, um, like wasp is in the, the, wa the common wasp, the word you associate, um, sort of the species you associate the word wasp with. Um, but so it's not very good at all, but it, it does fool them because the female will lay her eggs inside the wasp, ne the wasp nest and um, the resulting larvae will consume um, the pupae and um, dead wasps that are there. So these are some other um, insect orders which pupate that we do not have time to go into, unfortunately. This is include the fleas and the siphonaptera, the stylops and the strepsiptera, the older flies, which look rather like um, some uh, sort of a, a more hairless caddis fly in the uh, megaloptera. 
And uh, yes, unfortunately, not enough time to talk about the arachnids in much detail. There are 11 to 12 orders, includes um, sort of the spiders, the harvestmen, pseudoscorpions, and mites and ticks, um, all united by um, chelicerate mouthparts. So they're not chewing mouthparts, but they sort of deliver a similar function. Um, and they have two segmented bodies with no thorax, antennae, or wings, and most with eight legs, not always the case. And we also have a little few notes on the gastropoda or mollusks, mostly, um, as we've said earlier, most um, true terrestrial ones are, are um, uh, from the order Stylomatophora. There is also some from the Systelomatophora, but these tend to be only found in the tropics. And just a very quick word on the millipedes and centipedes, as I'm sure many of us come across these quite regularly in our gardens. Um, millipedes uh, have two pairs of legs per segment and lots of segments. Centipedes, on the other hand, only have one pair of legs per segment. Millipedes are slow moving, um, so, and that sort of reflects their mainly um, uh, sort of phytophagous or um, detritivore type diet. Um, there are 12,000 species and 16 orders of millipedes on their own, which is quite a lot. Um, centipedes, on the other hand, tend to be fast moving, and this reflects their sort of very predatory lifestyle. And they also have adaptations for that, including being venomous. And there are a couple of examples there, but we're coming up to the hour. So uh, thank you very, very much for listening to that whirlwind of uh, various insect orders and a little bit about others. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, if um, anyone has any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. I just also want to say quickly, I think that uh, just show this slide quickly just to thank the various unknown authors for from the creative commons for their pictures on the slides mentioned um all other pictures were my own um if um anyone has any questions i'm happy to take them my email address is also there so do feel free to send any questions to me on that email address i also have a facebook page george riley entomology I don't keep it as updated as I should, but I do do posts every every now and again. And um, so um, do feel free to give that a follow if you'd like to keep up to date. So thank you very much.